Hey guys, welcome back. Skitzone series episode 26. I'm going to go nice and slow and clearly in this video. Topic today is the finite element method. We already covered this in great detail in an hour and a half long deep dive. I'll put a link to that in the description. This video will cover more of the assembly language implementation for that topic. And we're going to focus on 3D frame elements. So we're finally getting into the actual nitty gritty engineering topics, which is a good thing. First off, an example of what this even is. Now this is a ladder, and this ladder is actually the same example that I gave in the previous video, just in assembly this time, not MATLAB. And so in green, you can see the undeformed ladder geometry that it's you know, pressed up against the wall. There's some angle here against the wall. And then in red, you have the deformed configuration. So there's someone standing on the top rung of the ladder, not very safe in my opinion, um, applying a load in that direction. And of course, there's also boundary conditions applied on the system. So these bottom two nodes where the ladder hits the ground, they're being fixed in space, both positionally and rotationally. And then at the top of the ladder, it's basically constrained that it can't move out of that plane that it's in. It's stuck in, in this case, the Z direction. Basically, that's the ladder is up against the wall and it's not going to move through the wall or off the wall. A couple other things about this. Um, the lines are elements. The circles and X's are nodes. We'll talk about that. what that is in this video. Um, and lastly, obviously, the deformation is a function of the forces, the moments, the boundary conditions, the materials, the geometry, all that. Um, but also one other thing that there's a function here is the scale factor. And so in reality, this deformation mode that you see here is very exaggerated. Um, I multiplied the deformation by a factor of 500 just so you can see. So with that out of the way, I'll get into more of the kind of the theory. Not going to go into too much detail here because we already made the other video, but um, I'll cover the basics in this video. So, what is the finite element method? Basically, it's a way that engineers analyze structures, among other things. The idea is you divide a structure into its simple constituent pieces. We call them elements with nodes, but you can imagine, um, you know, a bridge being decomposed into its individual truss elements or uh, any kind of house framing or railing or fence or anything like that, as long as you can, and I give you examples of frames, but obviously any kind of system, a table, uh, a, any kind of body, an aircraft, a car, can be modeled in the same way. Um, but in this video, we're talking about frame elements, which I'll cover what that is in a second. Anyway, the idea is that you divide a structure into pieces. So for that ladder, each rung, if you saw, was two elements. The rails had a bunch of elements along them, etc. Then what you do is you describe how each of those pieces by itself theoretically behaves as a function of its material, of its geometries, and of its degrees of freedom. So the two endpoints, if they move in this way, what forces are required to make that happen? and vice versa. How can the forces affect those degrees of freedom? If I twist it, if I bend it, if I pull it, how do those forces affect the degrees of freedom? That's called, those equations are summed up into a matrix, and we call that an elemental stiffness matrix. Then, once you have that matrix set up for every element in the body, you can then, based off which elements are touching which other elements, you can assemble a global stiffness matrix. So let's say you had 10 elements, you put them all in one, each of those individual elemental stiffness matrices you assemble into one global stiffness matrix in the global system. And to do that, you take the element connectivity. So this is element one, this is element two, and this is node zero, node one, and node two. Both elements one and two contain node one. So the degrees of freedom have to match. So if I apply a force at node zero and a force at 
Node 2, those displacements can move around in space any which way. However, at Node 1, it has to match. Right, you, you have to have those degrees of freedom from element 2 and element 1 match at Node 1 because they're touching. You, you, they can't fly off apart from each other. And then lastly, once you've characterized the entire system of equations for the entire structure, you can pull in all the forces that you're applying, as well as all the boundary conditions that you're applying, get that entire linear system set up, and then solve it. In our case, we are going to use, I think, pivoted LU decomposition, but there are many other ways to solve these systems as well. Okay, what's their frame element? Also called the beam element. It's basically a long, skinny object that you can describe the displacements of the two endpoints and kind of capture the whole system movement as a, you know, as a result. So basically here you can see I have this long beam in pink here with node A and node B on it. At each node I have a coordinate system set up where X is along the axis of the beam and then uh, Y is up and Z is to the side. Obviously that's all, you know, kind of random. You can pick whatever you want for that. Um, and you can see that not only are there systems at each end, there's also displacements, that's the U. There's rotations, that's the theta, as well as forces F and moments M at each of those points. So you could imagine pushing node A in the X direction, pushing it in the Z direction, pushing it in the Y direction, twisting it around the X direction, etc. So many different things you can do, both at node A and at node B. So there's six degrees of freedom per node, 12 degrees of freedom for the entire frame element in 3D. Now, if it was planar, different story completely, but this is a, this is a full 3D frame element in this video. And then one last thing, you might notice that the moments have kind of random arbitrary signs, some negative, some positive. That's all picked arbitrarily to make the shearing work out. But as long as you're consistent with the moments for all your elements in the model, you're okay to pick whatever sign that you want, as long as you have one negative, one positive, obviously. So positive moment y direction at node A, negative at node B. Uh, positive at node B for X, negative at A, etc. for Z, positive, negative. Okay, no big deal. What's next? So the elemental forces, those things in red there, need to be related to the elemental displacements. Those are in green here. So those 12 degrees of freedom in green are being related to those 12 applied forces by this 12 by 12 pink elemental stiffness matrix K. And it looks kind of big, and I'm not gonna get into the details of each individual entry here, but this is basically populated with various geometric and material quantities. So A is area, L is length, E is the is stiffness property, as well as G. Um, J and I are inertia terms, and that's pretty much the gist of it. Um, but basically, if you want to get details about how those terms come, you can watch the other video on this topic that I made. Um, and how does this work? So if you think about it, think about force in the X direction at node A. That is this guy here. So obviously a force in that direction, a compressive force, an axial force at node A. That is related to, if you think about rows times columns, it's rela related to basically this degree of freedom here and this degree of freedom here by these coefficients here. And they're equal and opposite in sign. But basically what you can think of is that a force in the X direction at node A is going to basically slide this element in the X, local X direction. And that's only gonna affect this value and uh, this value. Of course, the reason why the sign is negative for the second half is because a compressive force in this member is going to actually be this way at node B, and that's going to relate in a negative displacement in X. That's why the sign on this coefficient is negative, while this one is positive. But who cares about that? Watch the video if you're curious. But yeah, anything like that. So for example, um, how about this last one here? 
the moment at node b about the z-axis takes these four coefficients which relate, let's see, the second one, so the y's as well as the thetas. It's this one and this one, which makes sense, right? Let's look at the picture. So that's the moment in the z direction at node b, that's this one here, so a moment like this and like this, you can see how that's only gonna affect the angles of the two nodes about z, as well as potentially it could push up node A and push up node B. That's a displacement in the Y direction of both of those. Which if we go back, that makes sense because we've just marked those degrees of freedom. So there is a coefficient that relates that force to that particular degree of freedom moving. How much, well, look at the value of this geometric slash material quantity here. So it's pretty cool. If you have a system that's just one element, this can perfectly describe how the element reacts to a f applied force. And then usually, of course, y you know the applied forces, right? For our ladder example, we knew that the force was you know, 200 pounds at the top of the ladder. You, you know what's being applied to the system. You don't know the internal forces, but you don't care about that. What you actually care about usually most of the time is the strains in the system or stresses, which are just basically the strains times something. What is strain? Strain is how much each thing is moving, how much each thing is stretching. That's basically this quantity here, how much we're moving in each direction, twisting, etc. So you have this kind of system where you have the forces, which you kind of know most of the time. So they're the applied forces. This is a geometric slash material quantity. So you can get that by measuring, um, you know, if it's wood, these are the values. If it's steel, these are the values. If it's this thickness and this width, you can compute the inertia terms, etc. Now this, you don't usually know. And that's why before I mentioned our objective is to solve the system of equations. Well, you're solving for this unknown u vector here. Now you might know some of them. In the case that I gave before the latter, we knew that the degrees of freedom were fixed at the bottom. So that node, let's call it node A, all of these values here, u, you know, theta, u, theta, u, theta, were all fixed to be zero for both of those two points at the bottom of the ladder. And then also at the top, we constrained the z direction. So that was u, z, and u, z, or whatever. Where is it? Yeah. Well, for both nodes. So it was u, z for both nodes. Um, so you can constrain things. And how does that work? Well, I won't get into it in this video, check the other video, but you can apply constraints as well to the system. Um, and you have to, otherwise you get a, you know, an unsolvable system at, you know, singular, off the charts, condition number, etc. Okay, so how do you assemble that? Now you have each element, right? The idea was you created this 12 by 12 matrix for every element, every rung in that ladder, every, you know, frame, every stud in your house, you came up with this 12 by 12 matrix. What you do then is you have to assemble those into one big matrix because again where those elements touch you have to constrain the degrees of freedom to match. So in this case for this bridge you can see here, well let's go through the you know, process. So this entire bridge was broken into multiple frame elements and each element has its own 12 by 12 pink matrix. Um, and each of those matrices needs to be transformed into a global system. But then once you do that, you can uh, assemble one massive system where multiple elements that contain the same degree of freedom have their individual stiffness contributions for that degree of freedom summed up. And so how does that work? Well, look at node 13, for example, of this bridge. Um, it has its own six degrees of freedom six ways in which it can move. It can move in the X and the Y and the Z, as well as about the X, the Y, and the Z directions. And those degrees of freedom are affected by the stiffnesses of element six, element seven, and element eight. Remember, if, if element six is made of rubber, and seven is made of rubber, and eight is made of steel, it didn't matter that the two elements, six and seven, were very soft, the steel element was what made the system very stiff. 
And so that's why you have to be able to deform the rubber piece and the steel piece both with the same degrees of freedom and the same forces. So you're going to be adding up the contributions of each elemental stiffness entry at each degree of freedom. Of course, one key detail is the orientation of each element needs to be picked, needs to be uh, the same. So if you go back to this, we've defined the elemental coordinate system to kind of be x along the, the element and then y and z are kind of random. When we get to the full up frame system that we have, like this bridge, we have to pick one common uh, system, one common coordinate frame to you. So maybe call this one X, call this one Y, call this one Z, or whatever you want to pick. It has to match for all the elements. So you have to basically transform each of the local systems into the global system while you're assembling them. Not too hard, but definitely you have to worry about that as well. So how does this work in our implementation? Well, it's pretty simple. I have this data structure here, which encodes pretty much all the relevant information for each 3D frame system. And here are the entries. So the first one is the number of nodes. So I have a bike frame here as an example. You can see I have marked each node of this bike frame, node 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So there's a total of seven nodes, DQ7. Then we have 10 elements, let's count them. You know, there's one here, one here, one here, and there's four green ones, This, these two salmon ones, and then a blue one over here. That totals 10. And then number of element types. So this is a way to be more efficient. So I can say, well, all these pink elements are more or less the same geometry and same materials. So they, the length may change, but they have the same cross-sectional area, the same inertias, the same you know, material properties. And so all the pink elements are of one type, call that type zero. The salmon ones here are maybe a little bit thinner, maybe a different material or whatever, uh, probably not, but that's its own element. So there's one pink element set, one salmon element set, one green element set, and then one of those blue element sets back there. So there's one, two, three, four element types. Then what you do is, and this is something you have to do manually, is you set up an array for the nodes. So every single node, node 0, 1, 2, all seven of them, you have to describe its position in space, x, y, and z. That's how this node array is set up. And so this is a pointer to that array. It's somewhere else in memory. You put the address here. Then the element array. So in this case, you can see here, each row of this array is a quad word of three things. So each row is three quad words. So the first node of the element, the next node of the element, as well as the element type. So you can see here, let's take element zero, for example, that contains node zero, node one, and let's say its element type is zero. The pink ones are all element type zero, let's say. So then this element array contains basically, the first row of it is just zero, one, zero. The next one, next row would be for element one, it would say node one, node two, element type zero. And the third, and then element two, so the third entry here would say, okay, node two, node three, element type zero. How about element four? Well, it would say node three, node four, oh, sorry, that's element four. Node, th uh, element three is up here. It would say node zero, node four, element type one, or whatever you picked. And again, the order can change. So it could have been zero, four, could have been four, zero. It doesn't make a difference as long as you are consistent in how you make things match up. Lastly is the element type matrix. Now this is basically just a list of all the geometric and material properties for each element type. So the pink element, we call that type zero. That would be the first row. I have to write down the stiffness terms, so the E, the G, the area, the inertial terms, as well as this V thing. What is V? I won't give you too much detail. Basically, it's a, a vector that kind of is used to orient the local elements frame in the global system. So it's kind of a 
a vector that we can hit the cross product of the beam itself with to get the z direction. That's kind of what that's set up. So we'll put in a generic vector that we can use to orient our elements. If you're curious about how that works, check the other video. Then that's pretty much it for manual stuff um, for the most part. Then this function that we implemented here for this video is called the assemble frame elements function. Basically what that does is it takes this entire frame data structure and it populates a full up. Once you allocate the memory, this can populate the data for this whole matrix. This full, not, not 12 by 12, but the entire system. It can be a, you know, a million by a million. This function will populate the entire system based off the input data. So the material properties, geometry, as well as the node positions, the element array, et cetera. And then of course, you're trying to solve this F equals KU function. F is the applied forces, K is the system that we just made with this function, and U is the unknowns that we wanna solve for. So F has to come from something. Again, that's the applied forces. And I guess you could say they're always gonna be zero, but that might not be an interesting problem to solve. So in our case, the forces for that ladder were you know, 200 pounds at the top, and you know you can think of other forces to apply as well. Let's say, you know, someone was holding the ladder against the wall. Another force there. This is basically a encoding of this. So the element, well, the forces at each degree of freedom in the global system. So you have to make that yourself as well. So once you've got this set up, what's the overall process? So first was to define the geometry get all the nodes positions defined in that node array, define the elements themselves. So which nodes are in which elements, what the element types may be, as well as defining the geometry and the materials. That's all these items here. Number of nodes, elements, element types, <clears throat> as well as node array, element array, element type array. Okay, then what you do is you use that function I talked about to create up the full, you know, massive to this matrix and then you apply the boundary conditions so you may impose zeros here you may apply a displacement here you may apply a force here sure whatever you want to do you can do then you solve a system whatever way you want we're going to use lu decomposition but you can do whatever you'd like and lastly you post process so if you want to get the strains you want to get the stresses you want to see how it looks you can do that and for more details, again, check the other video. So now into the code. Let's see how this works. So there were two examples for this. There was a cantilever beam example and the ladder example that you just saw. So in the cantilever beam example, let's run it first. So it's a very simple, it's a beam with two elements and three nodes. And you can see here that um, it looks, it's constrained on the left. So zero everything at that position. And then we're applying a downward force at the right hand side. So very simple. How does this get set up? So let's see. In this example, we have to have a heap, obviously, because we're going to be rendering to the screen. Again, that requires buffers to render to the screen, as well as a few other things require heap as well. So the include of importance here is this, well, I guess two of them. One is the um, actual LU solve function, in this case, the pivoted version of that, which we use to solve the system of equations. And then we have the actual function of importance for this particular video, which was the one that assembles the entire thinness matrix. So again, we have a cursor that we're drawing to the screen as before. All the rendering is as it was in previous videos. I'll ignore that just because it's kind of repetitive at this point. So let's take a look at the actual um, data structure. So here is that 3D frame system. If you recall, there are indeed three nodes on that beam. 
you know, left, middle, right. There were two elements, right, left and right, and there was one element type, the way I, I defined it. And then I have a pointer here for all the node arrays, etc. And uh, let's see, I have those defined here. So here's the node array. So you can see that the left hand point is at 0, 0, 0. The middle point was at 0. 0.500. 0. The right hand point was at 1, 0, 0. And then the element array down here shows that element 0 contains nodes 0 and 1. And element 1 contains nodes 1 and 2. And they're both type 0. And what is type 0? Basically, it's a an element that has these two material properties, an area in the cross-section of one, and then these three inertial terms, as well as a generic orientation matrix, um, or I should say vector, for how we're going to position that local element frame in the global frame. And then I have some space in this binary set aside for the stiffness matrix, the forcing matrix, and the unknown matrix. And here you can see in the forcing matrix, it's 18 entries long because there's six degrees of freedom times three nodes. And in that vector, looks like the 14th element down is set to negative 50,000. So I'm applying a massive negative load at what's probably the Z direction or the Y direction at the right hand degree of freedom. And so how did this work? Well, basically you can see here, um, we have that data structure defined in memory. And then these two lines here, I put that address of that frame element structure into RDI. I call this function that will populate the global synthesis matrix for that frame system. And then I go through and I apply the boundary conditions. So here you can see, looks like I have set for the first node, the six degrees of freedom that con control its position and rotation are also the zeros. And so the way that works is basically, I'm looking into the details, but you set basically identity matrix for those degrees of freedom, and then you zero out all the rows and columns in those rows and columns. Um, and then I also yeah, put the put the one on the diagonal there. You can see it put 1.0 in the six rows and columns. And uh, then we get into actually solving. So now we have the entire system set up. We have the nodes positioned, the elements positioned, um, all the material defined, the matrix created, the forces applied, the displacements applied. Now we solve. And so here we're using that PLU solve, so the pivoting LU decomposition method. Um, and so we have to make a pivoting vector to kind of use to reorder our rows and columns if our algorithm requires it. So we've allocated memory for that, solve the system. And then this basically puts the solution in memory where we've given it space. So we have this unknown matrix. 18 quad words long that's attached to our frame element structure here at the bottom offset of like 64 bytes from the top so our answers are now going to be in that slot essentially so that's what this does here and then lastly looks like i free some memory for some reason i don't know why i did that and then i now add well, I create all the rendering stuff. So I create the green undeformed beam and the red deformed beam as a function of those solved degrees of freedom. So yeah, that's how this works. Oh, and then I should say at the very end, um, it has the same old rendering loop as usual. So perspective structure set up. And in terms of what's being rendered to the screen, we have a couple of different geometries we have. Uh, basically the line segments as well as the points both for the undeformed and the deformed configuration and so that's a total of four things being drawn if you look down here and so just again to show you the undeformed is in green deformed is in red and yes it works as intended so that's that's a good thing i guess <laughs> um example b so 
much the same thing. Um, again, I'll run just to give you an example of how it looks. So again, the latter example, a bunch of nodes. It's basically the same thing as before, just with more elements, et cetera, you know. So how does this work? Well, it's pretty much the exact same thing with one key difference, and that is that the it's it's too hard for me to draw basically to come up with the node positions manually. And so I've parametrized it. And so you can kind of can see down here, we have some parameters that control the ladder angle, for example, as well as the cross-sectional area of the rungs and the side rails and the lengths of things. And so you could change these values. Maybe we should. Let's make this value a 20. Make them longer, I don't know. Make the ladder, you know, how about some steeper ladder? Let's say 10 degrees, I don't know. Now, if we run it, you can see it's definitely taller <laughs> um, and it's more steep of a ladder. But again, it's the same kind of deformation mode. So the difference here is pretty much one thing and that it's not, it's that I can't define the ladder's points and geometry very easily manually. And so I have a function that does it, does it for me. It's called generate ladder system. And you can see here, it basically creates that entire 3D frame structure itself based off the input. So if you pass in number of rungs, number of you know, side rail elements between rungs, the height, the everything that you wanna do for that ladder, you can kind of parametrize it and call this function. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Besides that, it's pretty much the exact same thing as the previous one. So again, uh, you can do pretty cool stuff with this. And this is just frame elements. Again, there's shell elements, there's solid elements. There's many, many more element types out there. These are just two elements per, or well, two nodes per element. You could have seven per element. You could have nonlinear elements. You can do other things that you'd like as well. Uh, and again, this is linear analysis. You can do nonlinear analysis. You can do geometric nonlinearity as well as material nonlinearity and so much more. Um, also, you can couple things together. Let's say you want to, let's say this ladder at the top, it had a plate. So you, it would connect these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements together with a plate. Well, then you could add that shell or that plate element to this model with its own degrees of freedom. As long as it's you know set up properly, it can intermingle with this implementation as well. So anyway, it's very easy to do this. Um, took me some time to go through it, but it's not that hard. And if you look at the file size, that entire ladder FEA that we just did, define the ladder, you know, the entire rendering pipeline that handles text and 3D solids and stuff, all that together is 25 kilobytes. So not a lot. And by the way, a lot of that kilobytes is just random garbage. For, I can even show you what kind of garbage we're talking about. Let's go. Um, let's go to lib engineer fem. And here's that function that I talked about. This is the actual black box function of today's video. I'll show you, like, look at this. At the bottom of this program, I have defined in the binary, in the flat memory model, like a thousand bytes for the elemental synthesis matrix before it's transformed. I have a thousand more bytes just here in the in the file in the binary for the you know the transformation you know and the transpose and all this different stuff like I've defined and and I have a working slot here this could, this could all be on the heap so between these five things I could cut out and save over five kilobytes but I'm not gonna but I you know I could so there are ways to make this better more efficient but. It works the way it is, and I'll talk more about this in the next video, but with that out of the way, uh, thanks for watching. It's pretty cool stuff. Hope you enjoyed it. See you in the next video.